right, take five seconds to pause the video and read the question, and then we'll go through the answer. All right, so we have a 78-year-old female, past medical history of dyslipidemia, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, is evaluated at an acute rehab facility for dizziness during therapy. She denies any shortness of breath, vision changes, or chest pain. The patient has a history of C3 to C5 laminectomy for severe spinal stenosis, okay. Vital signs are shown below. Auscultation of the heart reveals a regular rate and rhythm with no murmurs or abnormal heart sounds. Lungs are cleared auscultation, which of the following undiagnosed conditions best describes a possible cause of the patient's presentation. So, you know, this is a really uh, classic example of when they tell you, you know, uh, when they're testing you on orthostatic vitals, right? Blood pressure when lying supine, blood pressure when standing. So orthostatic vitals, let's just talk about these for a minute. Usually you'll get a blood pressure when the patient is supine. You can do it when they're seated and then when they're standing. And usually you want some time interval, you know, a lot of people will say five minutes after standing, you might get another blood pressure. And really these orthostatic vitals are typically defined as a significant systolic drop in pressure, usually greater than 20 drop in systolic blood pressure okay, drop in systolic blood pressure, or greater than 10 drop in the diastolic blood pressure, okay, and sometimes people will also include, you know, the heart rate in here, oh, there's a significant increase in the heart rate, but this is kind of the general concept here, we're going to have big drops in pressure when the patient stands from a sitting position or a supine position, and so what the question is asking, and which of the following undiagnosed conditions best describes the possible cause of this patient's presentation. Again, they're having dizziness during therapy, okay, but really not a lot of other symptoms. They do have a significant history of uh, severe spinal stenosis, so there could be a neurologic origin to this. Um, again, the patient has a history of type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and dyslipidemia. So when lying, the blood pressure is 144 over 88, but when standing, it's 110 over 56. So I'm definitely having a pretty significant drop in the systolic blood pressure. It looks like a drop of 34 and a pretty uh, severe drop here in the diastolic pressures as well. Okay, the heart rate when supine is 102 and when standing is 112. So there is also an increase in the heart rate. Now, it's not unusual to have a small increase in the heart rate or a small decrease in the blood pressure, right, when you go from supine to standing, because as you go from a seated position or a supine position to standing, the veins, right, all the blood is gravity dependent, so it's all gonna come down. Our veins have to constrict to shunt blood back up to the heart. And so for a short period of time there, you're actually gonna have a little bit of a drop in, in preload, a little bit of drop in pressure as that blood moves inferiorly, right down to the legs. That will cause a transient increase in the heart rate at the baroreceptors, they're part of that, right? Because as the pressure comes down, the baroreceptors are gonna fire and increase the heart rate and have a little bit of a reflex tachycardia. So that's what's happening when you go from a, a you know supine to a standing position. But in this patient in particular, the drop is more significant, okay? They're having a much more significant drop when they're going from supine to standing, okay? And the respiratory rate, you know, this is kind of just, I would say it's just a little bit, addition, a little bit of additional information. It's not really gonna change the answer here. But once again, I am, leaving you in suspense, so sorry about that. So the answer is B. Uh, let's just go through some of the options here though. So A, carotid sinus hypersensitivity. Remember, this is classically gonna be a patient that is wearing a tight shirt collar, is very classic, or a patient that is shaving, right? Older patient generally, and they're gonna end up you know, passing out or something like that because of that increased pressure on the carotid sinus where they have hypersensitivity. Okay, and so again, this is gonna be mostly parasympathetic response, so we would expect decreases in heart rate and decreases in blood pressure. The thing that doesn't really go with this is number one, there's really no reference to some kind of stimulation at the carotid sinus, some kind of external stimulation. And the other thing is the heart rate's pretty elevated, which would not really be consistent with carotid sinus hypersensitivity. So we can probably rule that one out. Okay, so let's talk about neurogenic shock for a second. So this patient did have pretty severe spinal stenosis, which potentially could be associated with neurogenic shock. Um, usually it's trauma that you'll see with neurogenic shock questions. But the other thing is, you know, the blood pressure is pretty high. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that this patient is in shock. And the other thing is the heart rate's pretty high. Remember, in neurogenic shock, we expect bradycardia with hypotension. So that would be very non-classic for this uh, condition. Constrictive pericarditis is uh, classically going to be associated with um, something called pulses paradoxus. So pulses paradoxus. And I'm going to talk about this in a lot greater detail uh, in an upcoming video in this series. But essentially what pulses paradoxus is, is you have a decrease in the systolic blood pressure by greater than 10 during inspiration. Okay, so a decrease in the systolic blood pressure greater than 10 
during inspiration. This has to mostly do with a decrease in venous return during inspiration. That's possible. You say, oh, well, maybe this patient has pulses paradoxus. Well, you have to be a little careful here. First of all, in the board question, usually they're going to tell you, hey, this patient has chest pain which this patient does not, or this patient has, you know, a, a pericardial friction rub, for example. So there's going to be clues usually that they'll kind of give you to suggest constrictive pericarditis. The other thing is constrictive pericarditis is not necessarily associated completely with orthostatic hypotension. Instead, they would have told you that usually the patient would take a really deep breath. And when they took a deep breath, the systolic blood pressure dropped. You wouldn't necessarily see the changes presented where the patient is moving from supine to standing. Okay, so pulses paradoxus, not necessarily the same thing as orthostatic hypotension. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which this is mostly going to be in a younger patient. It's going to be in a teen usually who's uh, playing a sport and then they pass out, for example. And they're going to have, you know, very classic heart murmurs. I'll talk all about this in a future video. But the thing that uh, I just want to bring up here is that the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is classically associated with a reversed pulses paradoxus. Okay, and this is actually, there's not a lot of conditions that, that have a reverse pulses paradoxus. There's actually quite a few conditions where you can see pulses paradoxus, but reverse pulses paradoxus is actually very, very classic for hokum. Okay, and so this is where you actually see an increase in the systolic blood pressure, but this would not be classic, especially in a 78 year old female. The answer here is autonomic neuropathy. So the patient has a history of type 2 diabetes and peripheral neuropathy, autonomic neuropathies, these are all uh, very much associated with diabetes in general. And there are other causes here to autonomic neuropathies. A big one is Parkinson's disease. But when we're talking about an autonomic neuropathy, right, look at the name here. We're talking about the autonomic nervous system. We're talking about the sympathetics, the parasympathetics. And remember that the baroreceptor reflex is intricately involved with parasympathetics and sympathetics, right? I mean, especially for the efferent outputs. So if I have a neuropathy affecting those nerves, then maybe I'm not getting the appropriate changes in vasoconstriction and heart rate when I move from a supine to standing position. This is why it's very important to remember autonomic neuropathy is very much associated with orthostatic hypotension. In fact, it's one of the major, major causes to remember. And autonomic neuropathy is associated with a lot of conditions. This patient has a history of type 2 diabetes. That might be the cause, potentially. Uh, also very much associated with Parkinson's disease. And it also looks like she might have some spinal stenosis in that area that can also affect her sympathetics. So autonomic neuropathy, uh, certainly one of the better answers here.